I just want to welcome any new arrivals. We are just a few minutes before we go uh, live for our, well, till we begin the webinar. We are actually live now. Um, if, if you're here already, welcome. You're going to be in for a good, informative time as we talk to Tom Christie about his, his new book, Creating a World Rig. If you don't have it already, you should order it now or join the book club. We'll tell you all about that before the seminar, the webinar is over. It's a, it's a wonderful book. It's packed full of pictures. I think uh, over 600 photographs, if I counted correctly. Uh, and it will teach you how to carve and paint a three bird rig and also how to make sure that your rig floats well and looks well in the water. So uh, if you're a decoy carver, it's a must have. If you're not a decoy carver, you're gonna learn a lot from the book anyway. So uh, I think everyone should buy it. Uh, we will start uh, in just a few minutes. So hold on. And if you're not a subscriber to Wildfall Carving Magazine, we certainly encourage you to uh, become one. And we're going to give you a special deal um, during this webinar. Uh, we publish the magazine four times a year. We also do our annual competition publication, which shows highlights the top carvings from the best wildfowl carving competitions across the United States, Canada, and Britain. So it is international. And we also publish a couple of books a year. Um, Tom's book is one of them. And we have some pretty exciting projects coming up in the future uh, that we will keep you informed of. In addition, we have a free newsletter um, that you will get in your email inbox and it will keep you updated on developments in the world of Wildfowl Carving and Wildfowl Carving Magazine. And you can also join our book club. And that, by doing that, you get our books before anybody else does, and you get them at the best price available. So how can you say no to that? We have one minute to go until we begin the webinar. If you have joined us already, welcome. If you have not joined us, then you're not hearing this, so I won't say anything to you. According to my, my clock, it is four o'clock Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, don't forget to turn your clocks back this weekend. Um, and we are just about ready to begin the seminar with acclaimed decoy carver, Tom Christie, as he talks about his new book, Creating a World Rig. If you're just joining us, welcome. Um, you will notice, um, on your webinar page that you do have the option to ask questions in the Q&A section. So if you would like to ask a question of Tom, um, please uh, submit one and we will certainly uh, try to address all of those. I see we actually have 10 responses in our chat section already. We have people from New Jersey. We have um, someone from Nebraska, which is the state where Tom is right now. Um, I am actually, at the Ward Museum in Maryland, and our administrator, Caitlin, is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So we have quite a, we have a broad geographical spread. So I think we should begin. Um, let me close that um, and say welcome. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Tom Huntington. I am the editor of Wildfowl Carving Magazine. We are the only magazine for bird carvers. Um, hopefully everyone watching does subscribe already, but if not, uh, we encourage you to begin a subscription at a special introductory offer of $19.95, which is a huge discount from the $39.95 price uh, that we usually charge. Uh, you'll get the magazine four times a year, and we have complete start to finish demos on, on carving songbirds, decoys, raptors, owls, uh, pretty much anything you would want to carve, as well as uh, uh, showcase features about uh, specific carvings and carvers. 
and reference articles, which will help you get your carving uh, anatomically correct. Um, so take advantage of this, this offer. Um, you will get a follow-up email from us after the webinar is over and you will be able to uh, get the code so you don't, don't scramble to write everything down. We will get that information to you. And we've just been joined by Kristen Sullivan, the director of the Ward Museum in Salisbury, Maryland, which is where I am uh, today at uh, an incredibly gorgeous museum. And uh, Kristen will tell us more about that and some in exciting news coming up uh, later on in the webinar. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, to you Tom Christie. Uh, Tom is a six time Ward World Champion. Um, anyone in the decoy carving world knows and admires his work. He does astonishing uh, decoys, um, which is why we wanted him to write this book, which we just published. Uh, it's called Creating a World Rig, a Master Carver Explains the Carving and Painting Techniques that helped him win six titles at the Ward World Championship. So welcome, Tom Christie. It's great to have you here this afternoon. Thank you very much, Tom. It's good to be with you. And I guess the first question I should ask is what exactly is a world rig, if there is anyone out there who does not know that? It's a good, it's a good point because I've gotten some questions about that. Um, those that don't compete at the world championship may not be familiar with the world rig concept, but it's basically one of the five world championship categories at the world carving championships. And it's for hunting decoys. And it's a rig of three and they're judged. Uh, you can have all three the same species or a mix of species as long as you have a hen and a drake of one species. They're judged out on the bay under natural lighting conditions, weather conditions. You never know what it's going to be like out there. And that's part of the challenge and part of the heartache of that category. Um, but it's a rig of three. They're judged on the water, five judges. And uh, all, the, all three birds kind of have to work together to convince the judges that that's the best grouping out there from the way they project, the way they float. I should point out that, that Tom was actually the first ever winner of the rig uh, championship uh, at, the, at the World World Show. And that was in 1993, I believe. Right. Right. And in, in fact, one of the really cool aspects of this book is we do, uh, Tom did provide photos of all of his winning rigs and some rigs that surprisingly did not win, um, but actually taught him some valuable lessons about what he could do um, the next year when he competed. And in fact, I'm going to stop my share right now. And uh, uh, Kristen was kind enough to bring down that 1993 rig. Uh, which was a pair of mallards and a drake widgeon. Um, so if I stop my share, I should be able to uh, give you a nice close-up view of that actual rig, which I have right behind me. So let's give this a try. And I'm going to get my camera here. And I'm going to show these birds right here behind me. And this was from 1993. And interestingly enough, in the book, Tom, um, you do the same grouping, is, is that correct? That's correct. This uh, rig was from 28 years ago. I can't believe it. <laughs> Makes me feel uh, old. Time like ducks flies. You can see I, I chose uh, for that first year kind of birds that are traditional hunting decoy birds, a pair of mallards, and you often see widgeon with mallards. And I thought that would be a, a good competitive entry and they would project well on the water. And you can see in the close-ups, there's a lot of simplicity in the birds. At that time, 28 years ago, the, the vermiculation was primarily combing. Although there were uh, competitors like Jimmy Vizier that even at that time were doing hand vermiculated detail. Um, but I, I wanted to do the book focused on 28 years later, what would my rig of uh, two mallards and a drake widgeon look like today with uh, 28 years of experience behind me. And these are still good birds. It's, it's great to see them. And it's great to have them in the museum along with other great wildfowl art. Uh, but it, 
I just wanted to pay tribute to those uh, 20 years later, even though we didn't have a World Carving Championship this year. And the book is my 2021 rig, which will never see competition, um, but that's okay. Yeah. And I just thought uh, people would enjoy seeing the, the two different sets of rigs 28 years apart. Now, was there anything in particular that you, you found was different about the way you approached the, the new rig? versus the old rig? I think more detail. And uh, as competition has gone over the years, we push each other and uh, try to stand out from the other um, competitors in the rig contest. Detail doesn't necessarily win the day uh, because these are actually judged from 30 feet away on a barge, mm. but they're also judged in hand. And uh, so, the, the new rig has a little more detail. I do cover in the book both uh, combed vermiculation techniques along with hand vermiculation so that both of those uh, techniques are represented in the how-to book, part of the book. And, and you mentioned, as you can see on this page from the book, uh, the, I think this is the first rig you did was the, the golden eye rig from 1986, which of course predated the, the competition. Right. Um, those were the first decoys I ever carved. And they <laughs> have quite an emotional attachment to them because, because of that, that's what got me started. But also the picture included uh, decoy carving for me is a lot about the people involved mm -hmm. along with the carvings themselves. And that's my dad uh, on a hunt on the Portage River in Northern Ohio on a very rainy, soggy, cold, wet day and we were floating those golden eyes and had golden eyes come in to, to my rig of three. So it's a great memory and that's a big part of decoy carving to me. Uh, and the value of decoy carving is the memories you make and the people you meet. Absolutely, you absolutely. Um, here, here's some more of your rigs. We have the, the red heads, which I, I just saw in person a few minutes ago um, in, in the gallery in the museum here. And then the, uh, the shovelers, and again, we have those birds with us. So once again, I'm gonna to try to stop my share here and I will go and show you up close that shoveler rig, which is right behind me. Let's see, and Caitlin, maybe you could highlight that screen perhaps. Is that possible? There we go, Great. perfect. Beautiful birds. Yeah, I had. Uh, gone out on a limb a little bit with a preening position on that hen shoveler, but I had won the IWCA championship with a similar preening shoveler that, that year, and I thought it was a strong bird and really showed well on the water. And I tried to keep her head up so that you could get a clear profile from 30 feet away and then show a flash of color and uh, the rig was successful. I also made these birds a little larger than life size. So they would project out there on the bay a little better than a life size bird. That was a very memorable win for me because my dad and my brother attended that world championship, which was a rare occasion. So it was fun to be able to bring home the top prize with my dad in the crowd and my brother there. Yeah, and you have a, a picture of, uh, of them in the, Right there, you can see that if that has popped up on your screen. Right, right, there we are by the table after the judging had occurred and they put the blue ribbon on my shoveler rig. Yeah, it just makes it that much more memorable. Great day. So it, it, it's really cool seeing, uh, seeing all the other rigs um, in the book. Um, you get an example of the variety of, of birds that you've carved. Um, I mean, it's, it, that is amazing in itself. But you don't just, it's not just a start and finish demo book. Um, you also look more at the, the bigger picture of, um, of, of how you carve a, a, a good you know, world uh, championship rig. Part of that is composition and artistry. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Th this was a rig that was not successful in competition, but I thought it was valuable to use as an example of how composition, composition and artistry play into the 
the perception of the birds on the water and how they work together as a group. So I wanted to talk about that from my own experience. These I felt were some of the best decoys I had ever made individually, but together as a group, the composition didn't work so well. And I explained that further in the book to help people understand and hopefully see what the judges saw when they were out on the water. Uh, and I think it's a good, it's a very subtle thing and it's hard to explain uh, just with writing. So I wanted to use kind of some visual examples to help with that concept. Yeah, I gotta say when you're, when you're competing at the, the ward level, subtlety uh, becomes important. It's, it's the little details that will separate first from second, from third, from not winning at all. Right. And there are often five to seven world champions going head to head out there. So the, the birds that won fully deserved to won. They were uh, great birds. And I just use this example, starting from the pattern and going forward on how they didn't do so well. Individually, again, great birds as a group just lack something in the judge's eyes. And I yeah. wanted to talk about that. Like the whole is, was, you would say it was less than the sum of its parts, perhaps. Yeah, and it's a, it's a big challenge in the rig. And I talk a lot about that in the book and we don't have time to go through that today, but how you make the birds work together and um, tell a story, if you will, on the water. That sounds kind of corny, but you're right. It's very subtle things that will bump you out of the top three spots. Yep. And, uh, yep. so you, Absolutely. You, know, you learn from every loss. And I've, I've always said I've lost a lot more times than I won. Oh. You know, I won six times, but I uh, entered 25 times. <laughs> <laughs> In baseball, that's a pretty good average though. Yeah. <laughs> and then of course you do include patterns and you talk a bit about, you know, what you need to do to develop a good pattern and how you find that, the reference material you use. And of course we do you include the patterns for the, the three birds uh, in the book. Uh, so uh, you could make those yourselves um, if, if you want to. And, and Tom's patterns, I mean, I'm, I, I love your patterns. They're, they're artistic in themselves, I would say. Um, they're just beautifully detailed. Well, thank you. And you can see I've lined those three up at the water line, which I do on a regular basis now with my rigs, having learned from the redheads, I wanna make sure that each bird stands on its own merits and complements the other two birds as well. Absolutely. So grouping together is stronger than the individual birds. That makes perfect sense. And then of course, we're getting into the, the meat of the book, you do, do very detailed step-by-step uh, -step demonstrations of, of carving and painting uh, the three birds. And this is just an example from the, uh, the mallard carving. Um, you are a power carver, I understand. Right. I do use knives and uh, chisels, but primarily power carve. I started with hand tools, but moved from basswood to tupelo and I just prefer power carving. So I do include in the book all of the specific tools I use and the equipment I use uh, that might be helpful to someone who's just starting out. And I don't get a commission for selling any equipment. It's just, I thought it would be helpful to put in there the specific tools I use. And then in each step, I try to identify which type of grinding bit is used for that purpose and try to make it very exhaustive step-by-step step and leave nothing out so that someone could start and finish a carving. Yeah, it's, it's wonderfully detailed. Um, I, I think even a carver is, as bad as myself could get something that resembles a duck out of it by the time uh, he or she was through. And then carving is one thing and then painting is, is something else altogether. And I've had conversation with the carvers and uh, Pretty much everyone says painting is is what makes or breaks makes or breaks a carving. And um, again, you explained it beautifully. And beyond that, we actually have a, a a video that Tom made where he he will explain some of his techniques. Um, I will warn viewers that Tom makes it look easy. Uh, and when you try 
you know, off at home, you might not find that it is that easy, but uh, he certainly does explain it well. So um, we will step back for a few minutes and uh, we will uh, show the painting demo that Tom has prepared exclusively for this webinar. And it should be coming up soon. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks uh, for participating in the event today. And uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a painting demo for today's event. This is a Drake Widgeon that I've been working on. And uh, you can see I have the body pretty well done and down to the head, which I normally do last. And I'm going to mask this off and begin to work on this eye patch area and try to represent the iridescence that is on a Drake Widgeon's head. This is a, a bird I did a while ago now. And all of the techniques that I'll be demonstrating today on the head will be step by step in the book, uh, including the color reference chart, which is really handy. Um, I'm using this myself, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I go uh, to paint a Drake widget. Before masking everything off uh, to do the airbrush painting, I just wanted to talk about the base colors here. The uh, face is basically 80% white gesso with about 10% raw umber and 10% raw sienna to give you that buff color. The uh, eye patch is a combination of carbon black in phthalo green, just to give it a subtle but very deep dark uh, greenish tint to the black. And then the crown base is 80% warm white, 15% white gesso, and about a 5% touch of yellow oxide to give it that cream color. I've used this scrubber. This is a 1 8 inch Royal Crafters Choice scrubber. 9160 brush to scrub along the the junction lines between dark and light and soften those lines a bit uh, before we start the the airbrush process all right i'll get this masked off and then let you see that before we start the airbrushing a little tip on masking i use uh, grocery bags that we get for free um, and poke a hole in that. Put the decoy inside and bring the head through. And then I'll use masking tape to cover up the rest of it. It's a good quick way to mask off your entire decoy. All right, I have the decoy masked and ready for airbrushing. Just another note on the bag, it's quick, but make sure there are no pinholes in the bag. You can cover that with a piece of tape if you find one. And then I'm going to use the airbrush to build up the iridescent look in the eye stripe. And I'm gonna actually use four different colors. I'm gonna start with just phthalo green, not an iridescent color, but lay a little bit of a darker green baseline here. I'm going to follow that up with a thin coat of um, green interference. This is chroma. Then I'm going to hit it just lightly, just at the highlight area with yellow green interference. This is chroma. So just in the very middle. And then as a final touch, I'll use violet interference chroma and just put a little hint of some purple behind the eye. So, Since this um, Josania Thalo Green is not an airbrush color, I'm going to mix it offline in a separate cup rather than in the paint cup of the airbrush uh, just to make sure I have the consistency right before I put it in the airbrush itself. If you mix in the cup, you can do that. Um, 
but sometimes it can junk up your airbrush. Okay, I'm going to hit this lightly. Both sides. And let that dry and hit it again. You can see here that phthalo green has not changed the appearance substantially. It's still a very dark color, but up close you can see just a hint of a dark green, and that's what I want. Now we'll move on to the first iridescent color. This is the chroma green interference. Starting to get that shine, iridescent shine, again leaving the dark around the eye and on the back of the head. We'll do that again over here. Doesn't take much. I'm going to let that dry, come back, and hit it again. Now the chroma yellow green interference. I just want to highlight the center area. like that. This is the chroma violet interference. I'm just going to a little touch, make sure I have control behind the eye. Same on this side. Just like that. Not much. Now I've removed the masking and you can see the iridescence here and here and by leaving the the back dark and the front dark towards the eye it just conveys further that iridescent shine that you see. Flip it around to the other side. You can see that as well and this is a good underlay for the detail that now we'll apply over that. Using some chroma chestnut and um, a little bit of uh, the base color of the face to lighten that. And uh, a number four detail brush. I'm going to start laying in the face ticks. And I go back and forth in kind of V shapes as we're headed back towards the rear of the head in groupings of two, three, four, and then change directions, go a different way. And uh, I'm going to take a series of short videos as I go through this face ticking process so you can see the progress rapidly. As I move back on the head, these uh, markings on a Widge and Drake get a little more pronounced. So I'm starting to make groupings of two or three together rather than the small individual ticks. Now I've flipped the decoy so that I can start making these markings in the opposite direction. And you can see I'm just making a little series of three and four markings together. So they become more like little patches as opposed to the individual marks that were up here in the front. So small arched patches of the color. Under the cheek and down into the neck, the flow lines are kind of pulling back this way. And they split 
right under the chin, everything goes in this direction. And from that center line to the other side of the head, everything is going to pull away in that direction. So I'm just, again, using the small ticks in this area to then bring that down and tie it into the neckline. Near the back, these flow lines are pulling back and will eventually end up on a center line behind the head. Um, so I'll go ahead and wrap these around. Small tick marks joining the neckline. Tough area to reach under the bill in the chin area, but reverse the decoy and paint in an upside down position like this. Tick marks are very small normally under the chin. Just a quick shot of the first pass face tick on this side. I'll do the same on the other and then come back. Next I'm going to use uh, the base face color, that buff color, and go in here and begin to pull in some feather structure to soften this transition between the dark and the light. And as I move uh, towards the back, I'm also going to put some feather ticks down in here as this area of the head transitions from the light neck to the dark of the uh, eye stripe. There's often a lot of transitional feather ticking in this area that pulls into the dark from the light neck. So I've pulled those lighter ticks from the base of the neck up into the eye patch. And you can see along the eye patch, a little bit of feather structure there, including uh, transitioning up to the crown to begin to soften that line between dark and light. I'm going to do the same thing on the top of the eye patch along the crown using the crown base color. And indicating some feather structure here. Uh, again, with the goal of softening that line so it's not a harsh transition. I'm also going to come back with a little bit of the black and pull that in, and then uh, I'll show you the results of that. Using a little carbon black to go along this transition line and add a few feather ticks. And again, the goal is to blend across this area so it looks natural and we don't get a harsh line of transition. In the interest of time for our demo today, I'm going to just continue this offline. And uh, all of these techniques to finish the head are included step by step in the book. I'm going to be pulling flow lines into the eye patch. Um, hitting this iridescence a little more with a brighter color to make it pop. I'm going to add uh, additional light colored feather ticks to the face to create depth. I'm going to put detail on the crown. But again, in the interest of time, we won't cover that today in the video. It's all in the book. Hope you'll check it out. Well, that was amazing. As I said, uh, you you made it look easy. It actually makes me, uh, you know, we'll do a Q and A at, near the end. But someone did ask, you know, what do you enjoy more, the carving or the painting of a bird? That's a great question. I, it's one of the things I love about um, 
wildfowl carving is you get to do both. So mm -hmm. I, I enjoy the carving process and just about the time I'm getting tired of carving, I get to go to painting and dwell on that for a while. I suppose if I had to pick one or the other, painting is, I think it's harder for me and I think it uh, is more rewarding because you see the end product by the time you're fit, finished painting. When you're carving, it's still a kind of a, I think this is gonna look good when you're painting, you know the way it looks. Yeah, well, <laughs> with some painters though, that's not necessarily a good sure thing. Bad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. But as I say, you, you do make it look easy. I mean, that was just, you know, I've just, watching that video with astonishment because, you know, when, when, when I've painted birds, it's there's a scene in the movie Airplane where a woman is putting on her makeup, her lipstick while the plane is going through turbulence. And that's kind of what happens to my birds. Birds. It's like I'm all over the place, and uh, it's. I appreciate it that. It's tough to do those videos because you normally have to hold the decoy in a position that you wouldn't normally to get a good camera angle. So right, right. Awkward. Your hands are shaking a little bit, but I, I appreciate the comment. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff. Um, let's see. I'm going to just share my screen briefly here. Um, and slide. We're going to go to the next slide. We've done the painting uh, demo. Uh, we are lucky today. Um, as I said, we are at the, uh, I am at the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art in Salisbury, Maryland. And we are very lucky to have the director of the museum, Dr. Kristen Sullivan here, uh, to tell us a little bit about the museum, which has uh, a lot of Tom Christie's work uh, in his collections and on display. I saw his uh, uh, redheads in a glass case in, in the, in one of the galleries just a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, Dr. Sullivan's going to tell us a little bit about the museum. And also, uh, I understand there's a big weekend coming up. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me as part of this. And thank you for being at the Ward Museum. We're excited to see you here. And it's it's always good to be able to, to see a few pieces of our collection that are not out. You know, we try to rotate uh, uh, pieces from, you know, in the galleries and that we have in, in storage. and. Oh, I wish we had enough room to show everything at once. So it's great to see some of Tom's work out. Um, but yeah, I, I invite everybody here to make a trip out to Salisbury, uh, maybe during the Ward World Championship weekend in, in April this coming year, which, you know, fingers crossed, we'll be able to actually have in person. It's looking good. We're planning for it. Um, you know, try to plan to make a stop at the Ward Museum when you're, when you're out this way. So um, I do want to just mention, you know, that, like I said, we're planning for an in-person world this year. I'm hopeful. Uh, the guide for those of you who are carvers will be up on our website in a PDF, so a, um, um, a digital sort of edition on November 9th, and then we'll send a hard copy uh, early in the new year. But we're waiting until after this weekend because uh, we are making a big announcement on Saturday. Um, on Saturday, we're having our virtual fall migration gala, so it's our annual fundraiser for the Ward Foundation, which is the nonprofit that runs the Ward Museum. And uh, we are going to be introducing a new, a sixth world level category this year. And I, I probably should stop talking because I'm gonna mistakenly say what it is. <laughs> I'm so excited about it though. So we have a big reveal during that Fall Migration Gala video that's gonna be on our, our Facebook page and on YouTube, the Ward Museum's YouTube. And that'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, this Saturday, November 6th. Um, in addition to the new world category, um, we also have a new named world level award. The um, decorative waterfowl pair winner uh, will now receive the Tan Brene Memorial Award. So that's a new named award this year. We're really, really excited about it. It's just such a fitting award you know, for, oh, absolutely, for yes. uh, the, yes, the, the patriarch of the Brene family. So uh, lots of exciting things coming up and, and exciting other categories. You know, the, as many of you know, we, we had to cancel Worlds the first year right as the pandemic you know, took off. And we, we did a, a virtual edition this past year, but we had a lot of great things in the works for what was supposed to be our 50th annual and then our 50th anniversary. And now we're just saying this is the 50th, whatever it is, it's the 50th this year. <laughs> um, so so in some new categories, some um, new prizes, all sorts of good stuff. So definitely look, you know, check out our virtual gala this weekend on saturday evening and then look for the world's guide with all sorts of new interesting stuff um beginning on monday through our website 
I know there are a lot of people looking forward to April. So let's, uh, as I said, keep your fingers crossed and let's hope for the best because uh, people are just champing at the bit to get to Ocean City again. I am so excited. We're all so excited here at the Ward Museum. So I, I hope to see you all there in Ocean City this year. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for participating and for, for yeah, hosting you, Tom, this, this event. Uh, Tom Christie for also being a part of this and, and um, yeah, allowing us to be a part of your, your big book reveal. This is great. Yep, thank you. That actually, Tom, leads into a question. Uh, someone asked, uh, how has the, the Ward World Carving Championship and the Ward Foundation impacted your um, waterfall carving? Uh, it has, uh, first of all, created a lot of good long-term friends, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, we don't see each other that often, but coming together at the World Carving Championships has been a tradition that uh, I have really enjoyed and I have so many friendships that were created there, competing, banging heads together, uh, but then offline, spending time together, talking about something that we love and a passion that we share. They have, the World Carving Championships for me has been kind of the epitome of where I go to get my new ideas and see the best of the best. And just going head to head with the you know, the Ward Foundation has given us that opportunity to go head to head with the best in the world and lose and learn <laughs> and go back and try it again. And uh, it's the greatest feeling in the world when you come out on top in the World Carving Championships. I can and imagine. On that, the Ward Foundation, I'm really proud to have some of my work in the museum alongside such a tradition of waterfowl art and the collection is just amazing. If you've never been, you really should go um, because it's the best of the best throughout a span of time. And it's just an amazing collection, very inspiring. So uh, those, that's what the award has meant to me. Yep. And actually, that that makes me want to point out that some people have asked how, how they can get a signed copy of your book. And um, Tom will be at the uh, the Ward Show in April. Um, so come by the Wildfowl Carving booth and uh, you can purchase the book and have Tom sign it or purchase it in advance and bring it to the Ward Show and have sign it or join the book club and get it uh, that way and have Tom sign it. He will also be at the Ohio Decoy Collectors and Carvers Association show uh, in Ohio in March. And there's another opportunity to, to see Tom in person, uh, get him to sign the book. And I think yeah, you might be doing a demo at, at the Ohio show as well. Right, that, that was kind of my home show when I started with the Maumee Bay Carvers in Toledo, Ohio. So mm -hmm. it's been a couple of years. I'm really looking forward to getting back there and, and seeing all the people again. Yeah. Absolutely. And I should also point out, which I have not mentioned, is not only are you a six-time Ward World Champion, you are also a, a Ward Foundation living legend, which is a, another honor, another duck feather in your cap, so to speak. That was, that was a big deal. I mean, I really appreciated that recognition. It yep. It goes without saying. Yeah, and well, well earned, I would say, too. So I guess we are in the question and answer section. We are actually approaching the 45 minute uh, threshold. Um, someone asked, um, I would like to point out that we have people uh, watching this from uh, at least four provinces in, in, Can in Canada, Winnipeg, Cal uh, Ontario, uh, Quebec. We have people from Oregon. We have people from New Zealand, a viewer from New Zealand. Uh, a viewer from the United Kingdom and even a viewer from Germany. So we are truly international today. I think that's that's tremendously exciting. Um, but one of the people out there wants to know, um, who are the specific individuals who are influential on you in your carving career? I, <clears throat> to begin with, um, the Mommy Bay Carvers got me started. So a guy named Bob Lund, who's mm -hmm. still active in that club, and is very active in the Ohio show, took, took me to my first decoy content, uh, competition. And I thank Bob uh, for that because that, that really got me rolling. Then I went to the World Carving Championships, met people like Jimmy Vizier, Tan Bernay, Jet Bernay, Pat Godden, got blown away by what they were doing. They were kind of the heroes and the, the demigods of what was happening at that time. 
and challenge that challenged me to go back and get better. And then really my fellow competitors are the ones that sharpen my skills. <laughs> Just when I know I have to go up against Tom Matus or Del Herbert or Rick Johansson or Dick Rohde, you know, the list goes on and on. Jimmy VZA and Keith Mueller and Tom Fleming and we're all in there banging heads trying to get better. Just that process, if you're a competitive person, makes you want to try harder the next time. So those, all of those people, very influential in my carving career. Um, here's something you do address in the book. This is another question from a viewer is, how do you protect your eyes from when you're painting and doing airbrushing? Actually, I don't do anything. I paint right over the glass eye, and then I use a, uh, an X-Acto with a sharp blade. And you can actually use an X-Acto on a hard glass eye and not scratch the eye. Mm -hmm. The only thing, from my experience, that scratches the eye is sanding. And you really have to be careful. That grit comes out of nowhere and yeah. will scratch an eye. But, that way I don't have to mask the eyes off. I just paint over it and scratch the paint off when I'm, when I'm finished with the airbrushing. Okay. Um, uh, a, a viewer asked, is there, is there a specific rig or any other carving of yours that stands out as a personal favorite? That would be a, that's a tough one. I, there's one rig I talk about in the book that didn't win anything. And that was a, a rig of um, surf scoters that had a herring seagull between the two of them. And I built them all together as one piece. And it was actually featured in Wildfowl Carving Magazine. I remember it well. Year. And I knew when I went in that I was just gonna walk into a bus stop <laughs> from a <laughs> judging standpoint because it was non-traditional, but it, it just was a, a tremendous challenge trying to get the structure of that be able to carve it, paint it, put it together, and then get it to self-write. That was personally very rewarding. It wasn't very rewarding in the competition, mm -hmm. but that's okay. I, I had, I probably had the most fun making that of, of any rig that I've, I've made in the past. Uh, here's another question. Now you do hollow your decoys. That, that's correct, isn't it? Most of them. Yeah. And is there any difference uh, to the way you hollow a, 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 a Tupelo decoy versus a basswood decoy? Boy, I'm not, uh, I use, have used Tupelo probably for 25 years mm, now. Okay. So my first decoys were basswood. It tends to be heavier. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and those were made, those golden eye were bass, basswood. The first decoys I made and I hollowed those out. But I think uh, it really doesn't change between basswood and Tupelo. I just try to get the most wood out of the decoy as I can and still leave it structurally strong um, because I think any weight you can get out of the decoy is going to help uh, when you get to the flotation part. Yeah, absolutely. And we um, even put some of, some of my rig heads I'll hollow out with a Forstner bit and uh, some of my buddy and I have talked about that and um, it probably doesn't do anything. It just made me feel better. <laughs> well, that counts for something, I guess. Um, do you ever use oil paints or are you strictly acrylics? I have strictly been acrylics. I think, I think correct that I did one oil painted decoy early in my career. Mm -hmm. and I got onto the acrylics and uh, it's just, I like the water-based nature of it and the fast mix and the quick dry aspects of acrylic. And I know there are arguments on oils can be richer in color and I, I sure appreciate uh, oil painted birds, uh, but I've always done acrylics. Okay. Um, here's a, an interesting question. Uh, when you ship decoys to a buyer, um, what, what do you do to protect the bird. Have you had any troubles in the past with birds being damaged by shipping? You know, not recently with one exception. And I'll, I'll throw this out there for anybody that might be using these uh, garbage bags or the uh, 
not garbage bags, the, the grocery bags that I showed in the masking process. Mm -hmm. I had one decoy arrive to a, a collector that the bag had stuck to the decoy oh. and created just a very minor dot of damage that we took care of. But be careful if you wrap a decoy like that, the bag has to be absolutely clean. There may have been some touch mm -hmm. of oil on the inside of that bag. So nor normally I do wrap them in plastic because I think that keeps them from being abraded. And then I wrap them in bubble wrap. And then I set that down in a sturdy carton, extra strength, and then surround it with either foam or bubble wrap or paper. And okay. have not had a problem. That's, that's good to know. Um, um, so someone wants to know if you do any carving and or painting classes. You know, I, I haven't, I retired in 2019. I have begun doing some painting videos and those are available uh, to take, you can't see them on the website, but if you go to my website, tomchristyart.com, there, there's a black duck painting video and a gadwall painting video. And I think I'll be doing more of those kind of similar to the, the abbreviated version on the widgeon head that we did today. Mm -hmm. uh, and those will be available. As far as classes, I haven't been teaching any other than at shows to kind of support the show. I have done classes in the past at the world and also at, at the Ohio show and several of the shows around the country. Okay. Um, a, a, a viewer asked, have you invented any types of custom tools uh, for, your, for your work? That's a good question. I primarily brushes, um, and you can probably buy these, but uh, a, a good example is to get under the chin of a decoy that is pretty low and tight to the breast. Um, I've had to modify a paintbrush to be able to go around the corner, and you can do that very easily by uh, cutting the paintbrush and modifying the angle of the ferrule. Mm -hmm. I've created my own combs. Um, when I couldn't get a commercial comb that would give me the feather pattern that I was looking for, like on the breast of a gadwall, it has a very unique uh, scalloped pattern. And a regular comb that has regular uh, distance between the teeth just doesn't get it for that pattern. So I've made combs out of plastic. And uh, so every once in a while, you have to invent something to, to get the job done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are actually running out of time. So I think we'll ask one more question. Um, and it might be, it might require a little bit of uh, explanation, but how do you determine where you're going to place the weight on the bottom of a decoy? And that's something you do address in the book, I believe. Right, it is covered in the book. And uh, it's, it's a topic that I also talk about in the book is there are wide opinion variances among decoy carvers about how much weight you should put in a decoy, where the, uh, weight should be, how big the keel should be. And I just defaulted to kind of what's been successful for my own personal experience. I always, um, when I finish carving a decoy, I have a little, that's another little tool I've made for myself that I strike a line, a water line around the entire decoy. And then I seal the bird completely. And then I float the decoy and I tape the keel on at that point and tape the weights on at that point. Having done several hundred or a thousand decoys, I, I can pretty well guess where that weight needs to be depending on puddler, diver, what type of bird it is. So I can get pretty close, but you still need to make those final adjustments um, there. And then I nail it down. And uh, every once in a while, you, you have to come up with a side by side side to side adjustment because the wood is a little heavier in the grain on one side and it'll sink the decoy lower on that side and I have to make some adjustments on the weight on those. I don't, I'm not 
one that likes to then shove the keel all over to the opposite side because I like that it's just a I like a decoy to sit on its keel without help. Mm -hmm. A keel way over to one side, you know, um, doesn't do it. So I'll put a little weight on one side of the decoy and bury it in the wood to make sure I get a side by side that, that hits. And then my goal is the water hits that uh, line that I've struck around the decoy everywhere before I'm done. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I, I have to tell you, this has been wonderful. I mean, it's it's been 55 minutes and I was thinking we we're gonna end at 45. So um, we've been getting lots of questions, which means there are a lot of people eager to learn. Um, I do recommend that you, uh, uh, you, you, you get Tom's book because most likely your question is answered within those pages. Um, and Tom, I would just say one more thing. Yes, absolutely, please. Uh, I did want to thank a few people. I wanted to thank Pat Godden. He's a good friend, but he graciously agreed to write the foreword for the book. He's a seven time, 17 time world champion. He's always been kind of the one, the hero in my mind of uh, like the Brunets. Um, so I want to thank Pat for kindly writing that. And it was an honor for him to do that for me. I want to thank Tom Yu for putting me up to this and, and <laughs> the idea to begin with. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Ampri, the publishing company for doing that. And then also Kristen and the Ward Foundation um, for hosting this. I really appreciate that. And, and taking the time to bring out those decoys is really means a lot to me. And then one more thanks, my son-in-law, Daniel Muller, mm -hmm. professional photographer, and he took many of the photos in the book and they're beautiful. They are beautiful. People will enjoy them. Um, but that was a great project for us to work on together. So I wanted to thank you. As you should, they're beautiful pictures. And I would like to thank you for taking the time, A, to write the book um, and, and doing it so well and making my job easy. And, uh, and for taking the time to do this webinar today, it's, been, it's just been a wonderful experience. So thank you very much. Thanks to everybody that dialed in. I really appreciate it. And then I'll go back into the promotional mode for a little bit here. Um, if I can get my screen shared, it should pop up. There we go. Um, we've done that. I want. I just want to say, if you do join our book club, we have a book club where you get the book before the general public does, and you get it at the best price possible. Um, you can join, and it's it's free to join the book club. And here's the information, but you'll also get a follow up email. So, as I said, you don't have to scribble this down now. Uh, but if you sign, if you don't have Tom's book already, and you don't belong to the book club, sign up now, and you will get Tom's book and you will be glad you did. And uh, another great carver um, who we did a, web, a web webinar with, I think it was last fall, maybe a year ago, um, Rich Smoker did another decoy book for us, which is also a wonderful book, Counterfeiting the Counterfeiters, uh, Carve and Paint uh, in the Style of the Ward Brothers. And for those uh, participating in the webinar today, you can get that at 60% off the cover price for only 1118. Uh, the codes are there, um, but as I said, you'll get a follow-up email. If you don't have this book, um, you should have it. And you might find it's almost as good as, as, as Tom's book. And with that said, I would just like to say, thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kristen. Um, this has been loads of fun. Um, it, it was a great opportunity for me to visit the War Museum once again, which is always a great experience. And I hope to see you all at the Ward Show in April of 2022. So we'll see you then. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody.